sheet of some paper because it looks like we're all out of paper here. So I'll be back in a minute. All right, the last two steps of the development process are the wireframe and the prototype. So our fun today is going to be about taking your wireframe and turning them into a prototype. A wireframe, again, is a sketch like this, where you lay out the major sections of the page. It's not detailed at all. You might have one wireframe for your entire site. So for example, on a smaller site, you might have just one layout that all your pages are going to look like that. That's perfectly fine. On a bigger site, you might have more involved. So a typical wireframe might look like this. And again, it's a very simple one, but it works. If this is your page, you might have a banner going along the top. Navigation, the content area, and the footer. Now, which parts of those are going to be probably the same on every single page? Banner, navigation, and what else? Probably the footer even, right? Well, the only thing that's going to change is the content. So if we go back to our band example, all right, let's say we have a home page, we have a about us page, we have a audio sample page, we have a reviews page, we have a calendar page. Let's say these are the five pages that we need to create. Creating five pages isn't five times as long as creating one page, right? Because what we're going to do is we're going to create, for our prototype, we're going to create a template, and then we're just going to fill in this middle section here with the appropriate content for each page. All right? So in that way, it's not like we're making five pages from scratch. We're going to make a basic template. We're going to clone that template five times in this case, because we have five pages. And then we're going to go in and fill in the details. Now for the prototype, think of a prototype as being a rough draft. Um, if you were doing this, let's say I was hired by the band to create their website, um, I wouldn't want to finish the website and hand it to them and say, here you go. Because they're liable to hate it. And they're liable to say, I want it changed this way and that way and that way. In which case, I might have a lot of rework to do. That's why you create a prototype. Think of a prototype as being like a model or a rough draft. It's meant to be shown to people to get feedback. You see, here's the thing. We can talk about web design with people and we can say what we're planning on doing and we can get information about the organization and all that. But a lot of people really have a hard time giving tangible input about how a web design should look until they actually get it in their hands and start to use it. Then they can say, oh, I don't like that font, or I think it would be better if the navigation was over here, or whatever. Or we forgot about such and such. So the idea of a prototype is that we create something that's not complete because we don't want to take the time to complete it. We don't want to take the time to make it perfect if we're going to have to go back and revise it. So we spend our time creating a few sample pages, let people examine them, let everyone who's involved examine them and give feedback on it, and then we go ahead and finish them. That way we're not springing the final version on someone without them getting a chance to look at it and see what it looks like. 
Now, again, I mentioned for a small site, we might just have one wireframe. Um, wrong button. All right. If we were to go to a bigger site, let's say Amazon. Amazon has a home page that looks like this. There's a header. There's the home page content. And then there is footer on the bottom big old footer on the bottom. Let's go do a search for something. Let's search for skis. All right. This is a different format. Actually, I forgot to show you what Amazon looked like, their home page. It looks like this. There's a header along the top. There's the home page content. And then there's a big footer at the bottom. If I do a search, for skis, notice that that's a different, it's the same in some respects, it's different in other respects. We actually have for a search, so this is Amazon's home page. Amazon's search result page, guess what? Has the same header. has the same footer, but we have categories, items, show results for, and refine. So there's a different look, different layout for the search page than there is for the home page. Then if we picked an individual product, let's say we pick this product, all right, we see a different layout still. Again, they're similar. There's consistency. But remember, consistency doesn't mean that they're going to look identical. It means that they're going to be consistent, all right? And by consistent, all product pages are going to look a certain way. All search results are going to look a certain way. And there's only one home page, so that one, it's easy to make that one consistent, right? Because the home page is going to look a certain way. But notice that there's some consistency, same color scheme, same fonts, same position of the header and footer. That doesn't move around. But the details of the page do move around. So for a product, we have something like this. We have a header. We have the order inf ordering information. So if you want to order it, we have the product picture. We have the product description. We have the footer at the bottom. And then we have a bunch of other stuff as well. Customers who bought this also bought that. Sponsored product products related to this item, special offers and promotions, and so on down the line. If we looked at every page, it doesn't matter if it's skis or if we looked up Beatles CDs. Guess what? The layout fits that same model for a product page. All right? Customers who bought this also bought sponsored products and so on. All right. My point is this. With big sites, you might have a few different wireframes. But it's not like you're going to have a different wireframe for every single page. Right? On Amazon, for example, we identified three kinds of pages. We identified that there is uh, the home page. 
we identified that there is a search page and we identified that there is a product page. Now there might be, if we spent more time poking around Amazon, there might be a few other pages as well. But there's not a different layout for every single page. There's three or four or five layouts for the entire site. Now Amazon is a gigantic site, right? For a small site, you might only have one layout. And that's what we're going to work with in our little band example. All right? We're only going to have one layout. And it's going to look like that. We're going to have a banner, we're going to have a navigation, we're going to have content. So our first step is going to be to get this to work. Get this to look like this. And we're going to play around with CSS, we're going to play around with the HTML, we're going to get that to work. Once we have it, where we like the HTML, we can then clone that and make the separate pages all right, and then we can go and finish up our prototype. Now, the way we're going to do this, we'll remember, we're going to put the CSS in a different file. Why are we going to put the CSS in a different file? Go ahead. Well, you can use it for different websites, but... Right. In this example, we're going to use it for different pages on this website. We're going to have one CSS file. So you know what? I'm not going to be too concerned about getting the CSS exactly right. Because that's all going to be in one file. Whereas the HTML, once I start cloning the HTML, I'm going to have different code that's duplicated in several different places, which means that if I forgot a link, I'm going to have to go and add it to all the pages. So we're going to want to make sure I have that down pretty well before I start taking my template and cloning it. All right. So if we look at this, we're going to develop this in pieces. If we look at this, this banner corresponds to the header tag. Navigation corresponds to a nav tag. This corresponds to either a section or an article. We could call it either one, and I'm not going to worry too much either way. And finally, the footer corresponds to the footer section. So our HTML is going to have those four sections in it, those sections that we talked about way back early on in the game. I'm going to start out developing the HTML and then I'm going to add some CSS to it to get the template the way I like and then I'm going to clone it and copy it one for each page. All right, so let's open up Notepad. So I'm going to go in and put the basic HTML tags, the doc type, HTML, body and HTML. Title, the podiums, northern Ohio's I thought that didn't look right. Best bar band. <coughs> now of course if I ever did form a band, I'm gonna have to call them the podiums. I mean there's worse names, right? So my banner I'm going to put in the header section. And maybe my header will consist of an H1, the 
podiums. Maybe an H2, or maybe not an H2, maybe a paragraph. Northern Ohio's best bar band specializing in classic rock. and whatever else I wanted to say about them. Remember, it's a good idea to make it absolutely clear the website that someone landed on. So there's no doubt whatsoever. All right, no doubt whatsoever. So you're not gonna have someone looking at this like, wow, that's a really good band, let me contact them. Well, you know, for a club in Nevada or something like that. So I make it clear that it's a Northern Ohio bar band. It's not a band that's gonna be touring the country. It is, again, uh, or if I have a country bar or whatever. We know at a glance what this is about. All right. Now we could do more if we wanted to. If, they had, if, the, if the band had a logo or something, um, or a picture of the band or whatever, we could put that in here as well if we wanted to. I'm going to create my nav. Section and the nav section is typically going to be an unordered list. So I'm going to say unordered list. And I'm going to put my list items for each of the pages. So a href equals index.html generally is a good idea to call your home page index.html typically web servers have certain default names for home pages and index.html is one of the popular ones so I said we were going to have like five or six pages I said home, about us, samples, reviews, and calendar. Again, how would we come up with these? We would come up with these through the rest of the design process that we talked about last time. So far, everything that I've put in here now is going to be on every single page. All right? In other words, I want, we talked about consistency being a virtue. So we want the page to be consistent. So a consistent header, a consistent navigation is something that's important. Yes? Uh, how come you didn't choose to either put a section or an article? Well, I, I will, but the header and, and navigation aren't really in a section. They're their own sections. In other words, if I say a section or an article, that's sort of a generic block of stuff, of content. Whereas a header, that's a specifically defined block of content. In other words, this is meant to be the banner of the page, the header. Uh, likewise with navigation. This isn't just any old article or any old section. It's the navigation section. It has special meaning. So for nav, header, footer, you typically use those instead of a section or, or uh, an article. Do keep in mind that there's a million ways to do everything. But that, that's why I, I chose to do it this way. So I'm going to put now, I'm going to put an article. Funny you should mention that. And lastly, I'm going to put a footer. And the footer might contain something like, 
you know, the copyright information. And I might make an email link here. Now we're going to save this. And I'm going to save it as like template.html. Because this isn't really one of my pages. This is sort of the shell of my page. So I'm going to go up here and say File, Save. And I'm going to put it on the desktop. And I will call it template.html. And I'm going to make sure the file type or the type is all files. So I save it here. Now, remember we don't have any CSS right now, so this is going to look like the first week of classes, all right, when I open this up. All right, so there we go, all right. <coughs> Does this look like the wireframe? Well, of course not. <coughs> I want the navigation to be oriented horizontally. The navigation, running into stuff over here. The navigation is oriented vertically. All right. The way I have this drawn, I want sort of there to be blocks. I don't want it to go from edge to edge. I want there to be blocks and maybe borders around things and stuff like that. All right. Well, we haven't done anything with the CSS yet. All the things that we're talking about, about changing the appearance, are CSS issues. Because CSS is responsible for how the page looks. In HTML, you put the content. And if you don't like the way it looks, that doesn't mean you have the wrong HTML tags. That means that you, you need to use CSS to style it to get it to look the way that you want it to. Now, the other thing about this is Remember, this is our template, so if we look at it, there should be some content here, right? And there's nothing there. Well, what do we do? Well, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, one thing that designers do is they put sort of placeholder text there, all right? And one thing that's often used is what's called Greek text. Greek text is sort of nonsense Latin text that you can copy and paste. So I'm going to ask for two paragraphs of it. This is an old thing that, I mean, printers used to do this, right? Because if you were planning on printing something, you might not have the finished articles for a newspaper or a book or whatever. So printers would use sort of a placeholder just to make sure everything was lined up right. And there's a little story about it on the home page. Dummy text used for printing. So, uh, since the 1500s, all right? Now, there's some people that say that this dummy text is dumb and that it confuses the users, but I don't think so. Once you tell them, hey, this is just a placeholder, I'm just using this to make sure things line up right and look right, most people will understand that. So I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this. I'm going to put it in my template in the article. And I'm going to put it within a couple paragraph tags.
Now, the prototype could possibly, it's, it's okay to use Greek text for a few places in your prototype, like maybe, you, maybe the band hasn't written their biography yet. All right, so maybe you put Greek text in place of that. But your prototype should have actual content on it as well. All right, so part of the things that you're showing is you're not just showing the layout, but you're showing what the content is on the website. So don't use Greek text exclusively in your prototype. You know, if you're in a pinch and it's like, well, I haven't gotten around to writing or finding the reviews for our band quite yet. Well, then, okay, use Greek text for that. But you should have real content. So now when we look at this, at least there's some content there. All right? So now what we're going to do is we are going to start with the CSS, our goal being to get the page, our template, to look like this. And let's notice some things about this. First of all, these things are all lined up. There's borders around them. And there's a little bit of a gap that maybe we could let a color peek through behind it. All right. Also, our navigation is meant to be oriented horizontally. Right now our page doesn't do that because we don't have any CSS. All right. In addition, we could play with the font. We could get the kind of font that we liked and, and so on and so forth. All right. So that's what we'll work on now. All right. We actually have, for the most part, the shell of our HTML done. Right. Again, the one thing I want to be pretty darn sure about is everything that I want on all pages I get in this template. Because once I start cloning then, I'm going to have a bunch of copies to change if I decided, well, I want to include something else in the, phone, in, in, uh, in the footer or something like that. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create, I'm going to save this, and I'm going to create a new whoops, file for my CSS. And I'm just going to start out by saying body background blue. Keep in mind, for now, I'm just going to be working on getting the basics of the CSS. We can go in and refine it later and actually pick the colors that we want or whatever. All right. Header, background, white. Let's make the background white also for the nav, the article, and the footer. I did nav twice. So now I'm going to save this. And I'm going to save it in the same folder, uh, the desktop, which is a folder really. And I'm going to call it style.css. All right, so now what do I have to do? I created my HTML and I created my CSS file. What do I have to do now? Well, not add a style tag, add a link tag to link the CSS. Remember, the style tag is what you use if your style is right inside of your HTML document. <coughs> In this case, we're using a separate file for our um, uh, CSS code. But you're right, we have to link that style code with um, our HTML. So let me go and open the HTML page. And in my head section, I'm going to put 
link type equals text slash CSS, rel equals style sheet, href equals, and what does that equal? It's going to equal the name of the file, so style.css. So now what we've done is we've established a link between this HTML page and our style code. And that style code is going to be in every single one of our pages. right? Because when I'm done getting this down the way I want it to be, I'm going to clone my template several times, once for each of my pages on my site, and that link is going to be cloned with it. So I'm going to have the same CSS file. You really shouldn't have a different CSS file for each page. You might have a different CSS file if there's one page that's sort of an oddball. For example, if my home page had a different look than the rest of my pages, maybe there'd be a home style sheet and then a style sheet for the rest of the, the rest of the pages. But sometimes I'll see students like have like style one, style two, style three for each of their pages. Generally that's not a good idea because the whole reason that you put your style code in a separate file is the reusability of it. So now let's go and let's make sure that the marriage worked, all right, so to speak. All right, well, it sort of did, but it sort of didn't. All right, it's blue, but my head, body, and nav are not white. Or not, no, uh, let's see, header, nav, article, and footer are supposed to be white. Let's just file that away in our memory for now. All right, because actually this shows a problem. Well, actually, let's, let's deal with it right now. Let's deal with it right now. No time like the present. All right. If I view this page in Chrome, I'm not going to have this problem. All right. The page looks the way that I want to. This is a case of having browser incompatibility. And browser incompatibility is one of the most frustrating things about web development. You can do, do everything right and your page still not work if there's an issue with the browser. In this particular case, we have on this machine an ancient version of Internet Explorer. Old, 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 old. You shouldn't have this problem in lab. But there are still people in the world that are running this old version of Internet Explorer. So we have to deal with it. What is the problem? The problem is that old versions of Internet Explorer don't understand HTML5. They were written before HTML5 was finished or before it got to a certain point. So there's a little snippet of code and this is mentioned in your book called the HTML5 shiv All right, and really what we need to do is do this. We can just copy and paste this into our template. This is a little snippet of JavaScript. We won't go over the details, but essentially what this says is, hey, if you're running version of Internet Explorer, go and do this. And this teaches Internet Explorer how to handle 
HTML5 tags. So now I go and view it, and lo and behold, we get a warning, because we're running some JavaScript. I say allow it. Yes, I want to do it. And, eventually, absolutely nothing happens. Let's try this. Slightly different version of the same code. I'll save it. There we go. All right. I will post this example. All right. Now, there's a similar fix for Firefox, which looks like this. And I'm going to put this piece of CSS code right in my page, because you can mix and match like that. Have some in your page, some out of it. And what this does is this tells old Firefox browsers how to handle um, HTML5 tags. This doesn't make them completely HTML5 compliant, but at least they know the basics about like what to do with a nav section and so on. Now we could put this in our own. In fact, let me go and do that because that's a better way to do it. So I'm going to copy this. I'll paste that in there. I'm going to say save and I'm going to call it Firefox CSS. Could very well be. I, I, I would have to look and see the details, but, but could very well be. Uh, I'm going to go and edit this document, and I'm going to paste the link for the Firefox fix. Now, this is an important concept because we did everything right, but because we had an old browser, it broke our code. So an important thing to remember is that when you do something, you need to test it across different browsers. Because it might not be anything you did, but if the browser doesn't know how to handle certain HTML tags, or there's bugs in the browser, or if browsers were released before, before they were able to implement certain features of the language, guess what? It's your web page. You've got to make it work. You can't put up a web page and say, please send an angry letter to Microsoft complaining about how they didn't implement this HTML5 tag. You've got to make it work. It's your page. All right? So now, what we've done is we've handled just basic HTML5 compatibility. So let me go and view this. And I should be able to view this in any of the browsers that we have installed. And it will look the same. So in IE looks the same. If I view this in Firefox, it looks the same. And finally, if I view it in Chrome. Ideally, you want to test the, the, the code in as many browsers as you can, and in fact, test it in as many browsers as you can. And we'll talk more about that later, because there's automated tools that can do some of that stuff for you. Yes? So that little snippet of the JavaScript will allow pretty much compatibility with any version of that web browser from like maybe 
beginning of the web browser, like maybe it was just like version 1.0? Like all the way to the I, I'm, I'm not prepared to say that, all right, that it will go back all the way through time. Um, but these two things, these two snippets of code, this handles versions of Internet Explorer before 9, all right. I don't know if it goes all the way back to 1 or not, all right. But for any web, for any for anyone that's practically using any any version of Internet Explorer, this should handle them. Um, this handles people that are using old versions of Firefox. All right. So um, it's very difficult to like make a blanket statement and say all, but it will handle nearly all, the vast majority. Yes. Did you do Yes. Um, we will actually, most mobile devices actually, because most mobile devices are new, most mobile devices are, understand HTML5 well. And again, that's what we're fixing here. We're not fixing everything about the browser and making it compatible with HTML5. We're fixing the basic HTML5 tags. And most mobile browsers already get that. Now, what we can do is we can make it look different on a mobile device than we could on a desktop device. For example, multiple column layouts look good on a desktop or a laptop, but they look horrible on a phone. So typically most web pages are single columns when you view them on a mobile device. Well, we can set a different CSS file if they're using a mobile device versus a desktop device. So that's similar to this, but a little bit different. Okay. So now, we're moving in the right direction, right? We got the little bit of blue peeking around. What do you say we make this go not all the way across, but only part of the way across? All right. We can do that by setting the width attribute. So let me go here. And I can say width and I could say 800 pixels and I could put that on each one of these things a pixel is a dot on the screen in a nutshell so now I go and look at this and it doesn't go all the way across the screen but it stops. All right. This is useful because, again, if you have too wide of column, too wide of columns to read, your eye tends to like go up or down a little bit, and it's hard to read. You know that's why when you when you have a newspaper, the articles don't go all the way across the page. They have columns for that. That way, it's easier for your eye to digest and to go across and back and forth and all that. So we do the same thing here. We can put in a number. Or we can put in a percentage. So I can say 800 pixels, or I could say, for example, 60%. And again, I'll do that for all these things. So now it's 60%. And notice what happens as I make it smaller. If I make it smaller, the column gets smaller. If I said 800 pixels, I'll do the header 800, or I'll do the article 800 pixels. If I do a number of pixels, then it stays that size regardless of how big the window is. So in other words, on a desktop machine it might look like this. On a mobile device, that goes across the page and I have to scroll horizontally. And that's not fun to do on a mobile device. So because of that, generally speaking, we're going to want to use percentages.
Now, we get to a certain point, that's an awful narrow column. I don't know how wide I have my browser window, but it's pretty narrow. It might be 200 pixels wide at this point. Even though, you know, the earliest flip phone probably has a screen wider than this, right? Maybe, anyhow, all right? So you can actually put on a minimum width, all right? So I might say the width is 60%, but don't make it smaller than 400 pixels. So now it's at 60%. I can make it smaller, smaller, smaller. At a certain point, it's going to stop. This is a very effective thing to do like when you're doing mobile device programming. You pick um, a percentage, but then you give a minimum width as, as well. These, by the way, are all part of what's called the CSS box model. Because what we're doing essentially is we're treating all of these big blocks of data like little boxes. And we're giving the width to them. And we're giving, um, well, right now all we're doing is the width, all right? But we'll be doing other things with them as well. All right? I'm going to do a couple more things, and then we'll call it a day. Um, let's center these guys. All right? Because centering would look better than pushed all the way over to the left. So I can say margin. Zero pixel auto. And we'll talk about exactly what this means, but the auto, essentially what that does is that automatically adjusts the margin. So it keeps it centered. So now I go and do this, and my page is centered. Now notice how already, this, this isn't an award-winning web design yet, but notice how already it's starting to look a little more polished than the very first thing that we did. All right. Now, notice that we put a width on it, but we didn't put a height on it. All right. So we said how wide we wanted it to be, but we didn't say how tall we wanted it to be. So how tall did it make those things then? as tall as it needs to be, as tall as it needs to be to fit the content. And that's a great thing about browsers. Keep in mind that you don't have to control every single thing about the browser, uh, about, about your page, in other words. You can let the browser's own behavior control parts of it. So in this case, I controlled the width because I wanted to get the layout. I wanted a little bit around the edges and stuff like that. But the height, I didn't bother about because I knew the browser would do its job and make that as tall as it needed to be. All right? Remember that the way a page is laid out and the way a page looks depends on two things. One of those things is the CSS code that you put in. The other thing is just the basic behavior of the browser. All right? So, for example, this is a bulleted list. I didn't tell it to put bullets next to it. Why are there bullets? Well, that's how browsers handle unordered lists. All right? Let's leave it at this. Next time we'll have all sorts of fun. We'll make it look a little more finished and polished. But really what we're covering now, if you want to read ahead, is the CSS box model because we're treating each of those things as like a little box. And we can put different characteristics on it and make it look however we want to. Any questions on this? Yes? Uh, what's the difference between like uh, storing an HTML uh, between like a PHP file? Would that be like still compatibility? That uh, a PHP file. An HTML file is a finished web page. 
all right? It's a web page that the browser can view. I can just open up the, the page in the browser and you can view it. Think of a, think of a, think of a, this is the analogy I always use and it's good because it's lunchtime. Uh, an HTML page is like a sandwich, right? You go into McDonald's and ask for a sandwich, they take a completed sandwich and hand it to you and you can eat it, all right? Now how's that different when you go to Subway? When you go to Subway, do they have sandwiches pre-made waiting for you? No. Because there's too many possible variations. One person might want pickles, one person might not, whatever. So what they have though is they have a recipe for making a sandwich. PHP files are like recipes. They're instructions to create web pages. So when you execute a PHP page, I can't simply open up a PHP page in the browser because that's a recipe. That'd be like giving someone a recipe to eat. You know, that's not going to be very tasty for them, right? A web server has to execute that recipe, has to execute that PHP script, and when they are done, they end up with the same thing you get with a regular HTML file. That is, you, you, you end up with a finished sandwich or a finished HTML page. So think of PHP pages as being the instructions to create a page. All right? Uh, excellent question. We'll pick up on this next time and we will uh, do all sorts of fun. We'll probably spend a good part of next week just doing more and more and more controlling the layout of how these pages look. All right, we'll see you up in lab.